started to get commissions to paint iconic buildings, heritage sites and visitor attractions. The images were then used on high-class souvenirs, which I would design and have manufactured for my clients. As an example, St Paul's in London asked me to create an image of the cathedral and then supply them with a range of stationary items to sell in the cathedral shop. The Orient Express asked for souvenirs to sell on their trains and hotels. The Titanic Museum in Belfast, Imperial War Museum London and the Moulin Rouge in Paris. I was even asked to create products for Colony Williamsburg. To present my ideas to the customer, I found that instead of using oils or watercolours, I could create the painting by cutting out sheets of coloured paper with scissors and gradually building up layers to create highlights and shadows, forming a kind of collage. This process is similar to the way Matisse created his paper cutouts in his late work. He described his technique as having found a way to draw directly in colour. As a result of only using areas of flat colour, the image had a graphic and dynamic look, which I really liked. It is sort of retro, but also modern, quite realistic, but the flat areas seem to add a vibrancy. Once the client approved my collage, the problem was then to reproduce it in print. And because cut out paper shapes create shadows, I had to redraw the image onto tracing paper with a thin black key line around each colour, and then specify the CMYK values for the printed insert. This was a laborious process and took away the spontaneity of the original cutouts. However, a couple of years later, a printer colleague introduced me to a Wacom tablet, which I could draw on with a stylus pen and the image would appear on the computer screen. So instead of using scissors and paper, I could achieve the exactly the same effect by cutting out areas of flat digital colour with the stylus. The final artwork was a digital file, a vector file which could be reproduced to any size, large or small. With an infinite number of colours at my fingertips, the facility to enlarge areas for detailed work and the freedom to print my own work directly onto handmade paper with a large format digital printer, which sits next to my desk, I stumbled upon a method of work that suited me perfectly. No scanning or plate making, it is a seamless operation. Also, with access to a UV digital printer, I can now print directly onto virtually any material. First I choose a town or a city that is unfamiliar and intrigues me and limit myself to a visit of between two and three weeks of discovery. It's that first exposure to a place that is so intense. With fresh eyes and heightened senses you see things that locals are quite often unaware of and they tend to fade with familiarity. The architecture, the people, general street life, all elements that make up such a rich tapestry to paint. It's this intensity I try to capture in my paintings. Before my visit, I read up various travel guides to avoid any pitfalls. But don't really make any kind of plan and try not to have any preconceptions of what I will find. I want to record my discoveries. Tell a story in pictures, a personal reflection on what strikes me. On arrival, at my chosen destination. The first hurdle is getting to grips with the city, coming to terms with the topography and getting my bearings. It really is daunting. I just start walking and walking, trying to take it all in, gradually absorbing the atmosphere. I use my camera to take notes, recording the colours, light, shadows, patterns and the local inhabitants for future reference often revisiting many of the streets or buildings several times a day to look at the change in light. I can easily cover 15 miles a day. At the end of each day, although exhausted, I'll go over my photographic notes and reflect on my memories 
and plan for the next morning. It's not until halfway through my visit that a sort of narrative begins to emerge. I can then start to retrace my steps and look in more detail at particular streets where locals interact, which architectural treasures are of interest, how ordinary people live. It was on my trip to Havana I realised just how important the inhabitants are to the makeup of a city. They are the city. Returning home, back in the studio, there's a long process of going through my photographic notes and sketches. I go over and over them, distilling the essence of my trip. And a rough storyboard develops, from which I can move forward. The photographs help me arrive at the compositions, but do not play any part of the actual process of painting. I will have reference for the way light hits certain features, alternative perspectives, features, figures which I can insert later on, elements that can be added in the foreground, etc. This can take a while until I'm satisfied. Then a year of painting begins. At the age of 19, I emigrated to Australia and studied illustration, graphics and photography at Sydney College of Art. I think it has been the combination of those three disciplines which have shaped my work. I tend to look at life with a designer and photographer's eye and take a very graphic approach with the things I do. Looking back on my time in Australia, it was that wonderful quality of light that has had a marked effect on the use of colour in my work. The artists that have influenced me, the English artist Paul Hogarth. Whilst at college, his work was an early inspiration. His portraits and paintings of buildings and towns and his wonderful travel illustrations and books, especially the travel books, although it took me another 35 years to start creating my own. Edward Hopper, with his use of light and shade and his compositions, his observations of the ordinary and the simplicity of his scenes has always stayed with me. The graphic work of the English railway poster artists Norman Wilkinson and Frank Newbold have been such an important influence on in my work. They were both masters of colour, composition and the use of light. The architecture is what first attracts me to a city. My first book was about a small, quirky and magical Italianate village in North Wales, Port Merion, created by the eccentric architect Clough Williams Ellis in the 1920s as a resort for artists. It was here that Noel Carrod wrote Blythe Spirit, a perfect place for inspiration. With New York, my intention was to juxtapose classical and modern architecture, the Gothic revival Woolworth building with Freedom Tower. However, on my 15 mile a day walks, it was that ordinary street life that inspired me. So I ended up with a very different looking book. After publishing New York Reflections, I wanted a complete contrast, Havana. There couldn't be a more of a contrast, a totally different color palette Fascinating, colourful, vivacious, with crumbling tenements. A city with an earthy authenticity. Such a good subject to paint. Next, again a contrast. I do like a complete change of pace. Venice. The focus this time was very much on the architecture. Although I also wanted to portray everyday life there too. Venice Reflections was published in February this year and I'm now planning on the next book. Marrakesh in November, a mix of North African, Islamic and colonial French architecture with buzzing bazaars, souks and squares. I'm hoping for colour, texture, patterns and many portraits. And the future, well, Hong Kong, India, South America. 
I don't think I'll run out of places. This is a little fun, filling in time before I start my next epic. I have always owned and loved dogs and regularly go for two to three walks a day. It is part of living in the country. I particularly like to paint them. In fact, I created a Leslie Gary brand of homeware and stationary gifts with various dog breeds. Over recent years, I've been a frequent visitor to Manhattan, especially in winter and I spend at least a couple of days walking the streets, whatever the weather, taking in city life. New Yorkers with their dogs, every shape and form, hold a particular fascination. They do love their dogs, which seem so well behaved and quite social, unlike some country dogs I know. But it's that synergy between dog and owner I find so engaging. The body language, the fashion, particularly in winter, also, the interaction between owners and between the dogs themselves. If you ever feel lonely in a city, get a dog. You are guaranteed to make friends. Mm -hmm.